everyone see the slides? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Um, so I'm going to you know, present a paper today tying in markets with network effects. It's joint with J. Pil Choi and, and Doshin Jian, who are both uh, attending. Um, so uh, hopefully they can chime in if I'm messing something up or if they have things to add. Uh, and you know, we'll take it from here. So, um, okay, so I'm going to just start with uh, just couple slides just on on tying and, and you know I think most of this audience uh, will be familiar with these things but at least it will make sure we're all on the same page so you know what do I what do we mean by tying uh, so uh, tying involves conditioning the sale of one product uh, called tying good on a buyer agreeing to behavior regarding another uh, quote tied product um, so tying contracts, you know, can take a couple of different forms. In some cases, they're, you know, gets referred to as a tie-in, which is really kind of uh, just purchase, you know, a requirement, you know, the sale of the two products together. That is that if you want to purchase, say, product B, you have to buy my, my product A. Um, and that doesn't, you know, have anything to do directly with what you're doing with, a, with uh, other firms' products. In contrast, um, there's also, uh, you know, uh, tie-in agreements that are referred to as tie-outs, which involve not purchasing from a tied product rival. So if you want to buy my A, you have to agree that you're not going to buy B from a rival B producer. So in essence, a tie-out is a tie of an exclusivity provision uh, to the sale of product of, of a product, say product A. Um, so, you know, in the, there's a very long history, especially, you know, in the U.S. for sure, of very harsh treatment uh, of courts under what was known as the leverage theory of tying. And the basic idea in the leverage theory what, and the concern was that uh, a firm that had monopoly power or a great deal of market power in one market, say A, might be able to leverage or extend that market power through tying or, and bundling uh, to a uh, another market B, which is competitive or oligopolistic, and thereby monopolize that market. So, you know, the history of this, the intellectual history in the U.S. was very harsh treatment by the courts for many years. Uh, the Chicago School came along in the 50s and 60s and, you know, basically, and critiqued this with the, what became known as kind of the one monopoly profit critique. That is, that if you, you know, you can't extend, you know, you only have one monopoly power and you can't use it to gain two monopolies. And, you know, they had, you know, in some sense, it, I, I always have thought of it as a real um, piece of, of demonstration of how powerful theory can be that, you know, what, the, what they had were some very simple competitive, you know, very simple examples and, and models that, you um, you know, theoretical models, but very simple ones in which they made this point. And, you know, this point ended up being extremely influential. Um, and, you know, what they then did, so basically it was kind of a two-step critique. One, we'll show you a simple model that, uh, you know, destroys your loose, you know, hand wavy story about leverage. And then we'll point to other reasons why tying might be used. In particular, they pointed to the idea that it could be used as a price discrimination device, as in, you know, the classic metering story of, you know, IBM and its punch cards or HP and its cartridges. Um, come the 1980s, uh, there, you know, came to be a kind of post-Chicago game theoretic rejuvenation. So papers, you know, paper that I wrote, uh, Jay, uh, had a paper as well, Carton and Waldman and others, um, all put together models that were game theoretic models in which this leverage theory kind of made sense. Um, so, um, you know, kind of as in talking, you know, just what the basic idea, for example, in my 1990 paper, there was a firm, it was a monopolist of product A, that buyer's value, um, and it faced a potential rival in market B. And what the paper showed is that if, if that firm, firm one, you know, the monopolist in A could pre-commit to bundling, 
it could thereby profitably exclude rivals in some cases from market B and monopolize market B. And the basic mechanism was that a commitment to bundling made firm one more aggressive. Um, and you know, people, why? Because it wanted to sell this very valuable product A, once it committed to bundling, it would be aggressive in selling the bundle. Um, and if there were scale economies in market B, something that uh, the Chicago school had implicitly assumed away, that could lead to the exit of tied good rivals or block entry of tied good rivals and thereby change the market structure in, uh, in the tied good market. Um, my paper kind of made a point of that, you know, this commitment assumption was important and, you know, showed that, you know, without that commitment assumption, free, you know, tying frequently could not serve as a leverage device. Um, it did have some, you know, a couple of simple examples of where there wasn't pre-commitment, but I, I never re regarded those examples as particularly uh, successful, you know, at least to that was my sense at the time. And in fact, the literature since then has mainly assumed commitment. Um, and, and so, you know, it, in contrast, the, you know, without commitment, tie and the question would be, can tie in a right, you know, tie can arise as a best response, um, you know, and know it can because it can be a useful bundling can, for example, be a useful price discrimination device. But, you know, in some sense, you know, as an antitrust story, you know, the effects in those cases you might think of as sort of, that is, um, yes, I'm tying, you know, it's a useful price discrimination device. Yes, it could have effects on rivals, but that's not why I'm doing it. I'm just doing it because it's a more effective way to, to raise revenue. Um, and so, um, so in this paper, what we have uh, is a leverage theory of tying that doesn't rely on commitment and in which tying is adopted precisely because it can raise the perceived value of the tied product and lower the perceived qualities of tied product rivals. And by doing so, lead to the monopolization of the tied market. Of, of. And so that's basically what this paper will, will put together or puts together. Um, I should mention, you know, one, probably the closest paper to ours, and I think certainly the closest is a paper, is the Carlton Waldman paper. So, you know, as I'll say in a moment, our paper, uh, and the title already indicates it, you know, re relies on there being network effects in the tied good market. And Carlton Waldman, one of their two models does have network effects in the tied good market. And in that sense, uh, it's similar to ours. What's different with Carlton Waldman uh, their model is a model of complements and uh, perfect complements. Yes. So it's a systems market. And the motivation for tying in their story is to protect the actually the tying market from future entry, um, you know, to protect that monopoly that you started out with. Um, in contrast, in our paper, it's going to, rather than a dynamic story about future entry into the tie, tying market, it's going to be a story kind of going back to that leverage theory that, you know, in fact, a one period model where you're tying and success, excuse me, <clears throat> and successfully monopolizing the tied good market. Um, okay. So uh, what are the main ingredients of the model? Model, the, the main ingredients are going to be twofold. One is that there's going to be imperfect rent extraction in the tying market. So you have a monopoly in the tying market, but you, you know you don't know everything about um, willingness to pay in that market, and as a result, there are information rents that the uh, uh, consumers in the tying market have. And you're going to basically use that and exploit that. Um, the second piece of this is they're going to be, as I said a moment ago, network effects in the in the competitive quote or you know oligopolistic tied market. Um, so the combination of these things is going. What we're going to show is that tying can be a mechanism to leverage that unexploited consumer surplus in the monopoly market to create a quasi-installed base advantage in the competitive tied market. So basically, you're going to have these consumers who have unexploited who are having information rents, but you're going to end up using, basically by tying, you're gonna get them to agree to buy your tied good market, your, your tied good, that's gonna then lead to net, you know, get you the bandwagon going in the tied good market and, and let you monopolize that market, even though you have an inferior good in that market. 
Um, okay, um, and that tying is going to be profitable and it's going to lead to exclusion of efficient rivals. And finally, as I kind of stressed already, no pre-commitment is going to be needed uh, to do this. So it's going to be a purely best response um, uh, mechanism that um, to, to do to engage in tying in this way. I should say pre-commitment um, isn't needed, but you know if you can pre-commit, a similar story would would apply. It's just you you know you don't need pre-commitment in order to get this uh, strategy to work. Um, I should mention you know in terms of imperfect rent extraction, there are other papers that you know focus you know other papers in this kind of for, you know foreclosure and I trust work you know vertical practices uh, um, literature that focus on unexploited consumer surplus. So for example, Burstein had a very early paper on tying in which um, consumers had multi-unit uh, multi demands for goods and for you know, many goods. And the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, multi-unit demands, but pricing was linear. And so basically what the monot you know, his point was, well, you can use pricing, you know, tying uh, contracts in effect to extract some of the consumer surplus that you can't extract because you, with just a linear price. Um, and so, you know, in essence, it was a form, you know, basically like a form of Ramsey pricing. Um, that's a mechanism that won't work in our paper because in our, you know, we rule it out by having unit demands in, in the tying good market. So that's not what's going on in our paper. Uh, Vincenzo has a paper, uh, you know, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Very nice paper um, uh, in the AER. Actually, one of two papers. The one in the AER has is focused on exclusive dealing. Um, it has a similar, you know, it, it's. Similarly, it, it points out that you can use information rents to get consumers, buyers to agree to, ter to terms. Um, one, you know, there are kind of two differences between that paper and ours. One is that in that, you know, in our paper, there are in essence externalities across the buyers because of the network effects. So, you know, in, in their paper, in, sometimes, you know, a monopolist can get everybody to just agree to these exclusivity terms um, for free because they have information rents. But nonetheless, the different types, you know, you know, there's no externality among them. In our paper, there is this externality, and you what you do is you basically get these high the high valuers in market A to agree um, to your to your tying contract. That then worsens the, the quality of the rival in the Thai good market that's available for other consumers. And that's kind of how the bad bandwagon works. Um, so, you know, so that's one difference. A second difference, which is related, is you know, in that paper, you know, you exclusive dealing in equilibrium ends up being, in essence, a price discrimination device, low value buyers, you know find exclusivity less costly than high high type buyers. Um, and that's how the, you know, why, it, how it gets used. Um, so in a, in a sense, it's kind of, and in a sense, it's kind of a, a price discrimination story again for, ex, for the use of exclusives. Here for us, as I said, we're gonna worsen, you know, adoption of tying is gonna worsen the terms that the uh, um, rivals, um, uh, that the quality of rivals that's available to consumers in the Thai good market. Okay. All right. So what's the plan for the talk, um, you know, going forward? One, um, I'm going to talk about just a simple example that illustrates the mechanism. It really gives the basic idea of the paper, um, hopefully effectively. Um, I'm then going to just describe, you know, in, you know, without going into the details of proofs, the more general model of independent products that we then uh, generalize the example to. I'm gonna just have skip the complementary products case in essence. Uh, I'll just have one uh, slide that just tells you what we do for that and then briefly talk about applications. So I guess I have about 25 minutes to, to do that. Okay.
Uh, any questions anyone has that before I get going? Okay. All right, so here's the example, pretty simple, you know, pretty simple example. We have, uh, you know, two markets, A and B. A is a tying mark, is the tying market. Uh, firm one has a monopoly in A, and there are two consumers in this model. Uh, there's a low type consumer and there's a high type consumer, and the difference between them is the low is in their willingness to pay for product A. So, uh, you know, UH uh, is the high type utility willingness to pay. That exceeds the low type consumer's willingness to pay, which is UL. In market B, which is the tied market, we have two firms who compete. Um, the two consumers have homogeneous preferences for the two products. Um, that is, there the consumers. There's no heterogeneity among consumers there. Um, there's a standalone value for the two products. That is. This. By standalone, I mean ignoring any possible network effects of V2 and V1. V2 is the value of willingness to pay for product two, which exceeds the value for product one. Um, so firm two, product B2 is better than product B1. There are also possibly network effects that could be realized. And those network effects are such that if both consumers purchase the same product B, each consumer uh, gets an additional value of N uh, as a network benefit. And I'm gonna normalize marginal cost to be zero for all of the products. Right. Okay, so I'm gonna make three assumptions. Um, the first assumption, A1 says that two, two times UL is bigger than UH. And what this basically is saying is that the optimal, if you have independent pricing of A and B, the optimal monopoly price for the, in market A is UL. That is, you'd rather sell, it's more profitable to sell to both consumers at a price of UL than to sell to just the high type consumer at a price of UH. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna mean that consumer H has information rents. Consumer H receives a surplus of what I'll call S, which is the difference between UH and UL. Okay, assumption two, is that N, the network benefit, is bigger than delta. I'm defining delta here to be the quality difference in market B, V2 minus V1. And so what this says is that there's at least a potential for network effects to exceed the quality differential. If you can get everyone on the bandwagon, you actually will have a better product than the rival if you're the only one. The third assumption is that the this information rent S is large enough. That is in particular that it's bigger than two times the network benefit. So it's saying that the unexploited surplus in market A for consumer H can exceed and by enough the possible network benefits in market B. And that's gonna be what helps us get the, allows us to get this bandwagon moving. Okay. All right, so let's first talk about what happens with independent pricing. Uh, that is, if we don't have tying, well, in market A, like I just said, the monopoly price is going to be PA star equals UL. What about in market B? Well, market B has network effects. There can be multiple Nash equilibria. So throughout the paper, we restrict, we allow consumers to coordinate uh, formally by having their response be a coalition proof equilibrium. Um, and that, in the case of these, in this example, the consumers in market B have are homogeneous, they have this, you know, the, exactly the same preferences. So they're just gonna coordinate in their response to whatever the prices are, they will respond uh, to choose their Pareto optimal outcome. And so the, the result of that is that the pricing equilibrium in market B is such that firm two wins, uh, it has the better product, its price it, it can charge is exactly delta, its quality differential. And firm B1 loses, you know, firm one loses and charges a price for B1 equal to zero. Um, all consumers will buy the better quality product and realize, and you know, as a result, there are full network effects being realized. Moreover, that network effect is redounding to the benefit of consumers. It's getting competed away because the, you know, from the standpoint of the competition here, the two 
firms, even though they have different qualities, uh, they are in a similar position with regard to the network benefit and they compete it away. Um, profits end up in this with independent pricing being that firm one's profit is two times UL, firm two's is two times delta the quality differential. Okay, so very straightforward what happens with independent pricing. Okay, so now let's think about um, what happens if you're allowed to bundle, what firm one can do. And in, in particular, what I want to show you is that if we start at this independent pricing equilibrium and allow bundling, that firm one has a profitable deviation to introduce a bundle um, and actually introduce a bundle and in fact only offer a bundle. So, uh, so let's let me go through that. And that's going to break, you know, that will break this independent pricing equilibrium uh, and show you that we're going to end up having bundling um, happening. Um, okay. So let's consider firm one to, you know, introduce a bundle of A and B1 at a price equal to its old monopoly, you know, what the single, you know, market A monopoly price would have been, namely UL. So imagine we're in this independent pricing equilibrium, firm one's losing in market B, setting a price of zero, firm one in market A is charging this monopoly price equal to UL. It suddenly deviates, gets rid of its independent pricing, introduces a bundle that's priced at UL. Okay, so the first point is if it does this, it's gonna be a dominant strategy for consumer, under the assumptions I've made for, for consumer H to purchase the bundle to agree to purchase the bundle. And when I say a dominant strategy, what I'm going to show you in this next inequality is even if the price of product B2 were zero and consumer and consumer H assumes that consumer L bought B2. So it, yeah, you know, B so the bundle wasn't going to have any network benefits, it would still be worthwhile for consumer H to agree. Okay. So What's the inequality? The left side here is the value of, of um, buying the bundle when you have no network benefits by doing so, which is UH plus V1 minus the price of the bundle, capital P, which will be, as I said up here, is equal to UL, is bigger than the value of buying B2. And the value of buying B2 is first the standalone value of V2 plus the network benefit N. Okay, well, if I just rewrite that condition, that condition says, is equivalent to saying that S, the surplus that type H gets from buying uh, in, in market A, UH minus UL, is bigger than delta plus N. But the assumptions we through say that N is bigger than delta, so 2N is bigger than the right-hand side, and as well, we assumed in, in assumption three that S is bigger than 2N. So this inequality holds and consumer H finds it a dominant strategy to agree. Okay. All right, now let's look at consumer L and apply iterative dominance. So given that consumer H is agreeing, consumer L's going to purchase the bundle as well. Why? Well, on the left-hand side of this inequality is the value of buying the bundle, which is UL plus V1, V1 is the standalone value, but as well, because if you if consumer L buys the bundle, consumer L gets the network benefit N and then pays the bundle price P. And on the right-hand side of the inequality is the standalone value of buying the bundle, uh, of buying B2, which is V2. And I've assumed the best, you know, the worst possible case for uh, firm one, which is that B2 is priced at zero. So that's in a, that inequality is equivalent to the inequality n bigger than delta, which is something we've assumed. So once consumer H buys the bundle, the bandwagon is started and consumer L is going to buy it as well. Okay, so both consumers buy the bundle. The price of the bundle is UL, so the profit from doing so is two times UL, which is exactly the same profit as under independent pricing. Except notice that these inequalities that we just went through were both strict inequalities. 
And so I could have, in fact, charged a little more than UL for the bundle and gotten everyone on board. And so, in fact, there's a bundle, a deviation to bundling where you price a little above UL that, that through iterated dominance is guaranteed to lead to an increase in profit compared to independent pricing. So that's basically the example, okay? Any questions anyone has on that? Okay. Maybe so I can ask a question on that. Um, yeah, I was wondering whether consumers would have a interest in buying both the bundle and- Oh yeah, the perfect. <laughs> Sorry, finish your question. <laughs> know what it yeah, is. Because no, with B, buying B2, they get the better standalone right. value. So they could combine that with the getting product A. Thanks. I meant when I went through this first inequality, I meant to say something about that. So yes, that is, that's an issue. So, you know, what we're assuming here is that, you know, what you're doing when you bundle is a tie out. Okay. You're explicitly saying you can't buy product B2. Okay. It's not always necessary to do that. So for example, it is necessary when the costs, marginal costs are in fact zero. If the marginal costs we're actually positive for these products. It could be that without the explicit tie out, you still would, you know, a consumer would never have an incentive to buy the bundle in order to just get A and then buy B2. But in the case that I've assumed where I've normalized cost to zero, you would have an explicit requirements contract, a tie out that said you aren't going to buy B2. So thanks very much for bringing that up. Okay, um, model with independent products. So I'm just gonna hear, here, I'm just going to kind of give you a sense of the model and, and the structure of what we, of the results that we do, that we uh, show. Um, but the basic idea of, that, of everything is what I just showed you, okay? All right, so what's the general model? Firm one has a monopoly. You are, is the consumer, are the, uh, represents consumer's valuations for product A distributed on alpha to alpha plus U upper bar. And we're gonna define, uh, so the lowest possible value for product A is alpha, um, which could be positive. A consumer's type is gonna be defined as the difference between its value and alpha, how much above alpha their, uh, their value is. And uh, the distribution of that type is gonna be according to a CDFG, which has a monotone hazard rate condition. The price of product A, um, we'll off, in the paper, we often do a change of variables, which uh, states, you know, kind of a net price above alpha for product A. And that lets us write the demand for product A as just, you know, one minus G of PA hat, which is that next, that net price. Um, profit maximization is just maximizing PA hat plus alpha. That's the total price my, times the demand one minus G of PA hat. And we get standard first order condition. And in some cases, if alpha is big enough, every, uh, the optimal monopoly price will be to sell to everyone, which is the quote full coverage case. Um, one just quick remark, you know, uh, in terms of interpretation, uh, you can interpret what's going on in market A equivalently as being that uh, product A is a two-sided platform. And consumers' valuations are those types, but the platform also is getting advertising revenue uh, of alpha per consumer. And if you go back to its objective function, you know, here, profit maximization, you can see that, that PA hat would be the price to consumers. Alpha here would be, in essence, the revenue earned per consumer or equivalently a negative marginal cost. Okay. Uh, the tied market, Firms one and two compete. Consumers, again, have homogeneous valuations. There's a standalone value VI and network benefits, which are beta times NI, where NI is the total number of consumers who use BI. V2 is, a, is bigger than V1. Uh, so assumption one, again, delta is the quality differential. That's positive. Beta is bigger than delta, which is an that, like our previous assumption that network effects are important enough. And there's a stability condition that we're assuming as well. Okay. Independent pricing game. 
just as before, uh, there's a monopoly price, PA star, that now need not involve full coverage. It could have just some consumers being, you know, being excluded in market A. Um, and then again, applying coalition proofness, the equilibrium in market B with independent pricing is that firm B, uh, firm two wins and charges its quality differential. Okay, so in the general model, we then uh, you know and analyze tying. We now say, well, suppose firm one is allowed to tie. Um, what's the effect of that? And we introduce assumption two here, which is a condition that is a sufficient condition for the you know ban for this uh, monopolization effect of tying to to go through. And uh, it's basically saying you know it more likely to hold if alpha is is large. Um, it's also more likely to hold if delta over uh, beta over delta is large. So if the network effect is much more important than the quality differential, uh, it's more likely to hold. And it always holds if we have full coverage um, in market A. Um, I, anyway, I won't go and show you that, but um, in the paper, we point that out. Okay. So the first thing that we show is that you can effectively, in this setting, you know, for firm one, uh, without loss of generality, you can just think of firm one as either optimally best responding with an with independent pricing, or alternatively optimally responding with a bond with a tying, uh, effectively a tying contract where it only offers a bundle at price capital P and product B one at a price PB1, but it doesn't offer product A separately. And uh, this figure kind of just gives you the idea of why this is true. So this, what I've done in this figure is arrayed consumers according to their type from left to right. Um, and I'm depicting a situation here where the bundle price P, capital P is less than the sum of PA and PB1. So that's why P minus PB1 is to the left of PA. So if you think about consumers types here, you know, consumers in set one are either going to buy B1 or B2. They're not going to buy the bundle because the increment relative to buying B1, uh, the incremental cost of, of going to the bundle, which gives you product A, is above their types. And they, so they're either going to buy B1 or B2. Set two is either going to buy the bundle or B2 because for them, buying the bundle is worthwhile. The incremental cost of the bundle is bigger than uh, the price differential uh, relative. And then finally, in set three, you're either gonna, a consumer there is either going to buy the bundle or a combination of A and B2. And the reason is their utility from A, set and price sold separately, uh, is their, their utility from A is bigger than the price of A sold separately. So if they buy B2, they're also going to buy A separately from the monopolist. And so one thing you can see here is the only consumers who are going to buy just A by itself are in set three. And if the, the firm is in fact selling A separately at all, what you can see here is that B, you know, it's doing so because A, the AB2 combination is better than the bundle. Okay, well, if that's true, it's also true that for set two, B2 is better than the bundle. And for set one, B2 is better than just B1. And so that tells you that in that case, the only sales that firm one is making are sales of product, uh, you know, uh, are sales of product A to set three. But if that's true, the firm would be better off doing independent pricing. And so, you know, weekly better off. And so that's kind of how you see that um, one of these two things is gonna be the, the best response, is, is gonna be a best response. Okay, so that's the first thing we show. The second thing we show is a similar result to the example. So in the example, we showed that there was a deviation to bundling that uh, breaks the independent pricing equilibrium. Um, we do the same thing in the general model. In the general model, what we do is we show that introducing, deviating to just, just having a bundle that 
basically gets exactly the same set of consumers who were, would have been buying product A to buy the bundle uh, is a profit maximizing deviation, uh, profit increasing deviation. And this is just the condition of what the bundle price would be, which is the condition that says that a consumer whose type is exactly PA at star, the, the net optimal monopoly price in market A with independent pricing, that that type of consumer would be indifferent if everyone who had a higher value uh, for product A bought the bundle and everyone with a lower uh, value for product A bought B2. And importantly, the argument here is exactly as well an iterated dominance argument. That is that we start at the top with the highest valuation consumers, and they are for sure going to buy this bundle at this price that I've just described. And then the bandwagon starts and everybody with a type, all of the types that I've just said will buy the bundle, will do so um, you know, through a process of iterated deletion of dominance, of dominated strategies. Um, okay, so like the example, that just shows you that um, independent pricing equilibrium is broken. The neither the example nor this result tells you what the equilibrium actually is. And so our main proposition, which is a morass of words on this slide, I apologize for that, um, is basically telling you what the equilibrium is. And so there are two cases. Case one says if alpha plus beta is bigger than one over G of zero, <laughs> then in that case, the equilibrium is that firm one, in fact, only sells a bundle in equilibrium, um, and it does so at a price of alpha plus beta minus delta. It sells it to everyone. Um, so there's full coverage in terms of sales of the bundle. Um, and in doing so, of course, it monopolizes market B. The second case is, uh, and that case I should say always holds when we have um, full coverage with independent pricing in market A. The second case is a case is, you know, the, con the converse the case. And in that case, firm one actually sells both a bundle and product B1 separately. And so it sells the bundle to high enough value consumers in particular, consumers who have a type above some critical type, what I've called here X tilde star, uh, which is given by equation one, and it sells B1 to lower value consumers. And again, it monopolizes market B. So that's the main result. Um, let me take, uh, I may just take two minutes to finish the rest of this. Um, okay. So welfare and uh, welfare uh, can in principle can in general be ambiguous. Monopolization of market B is inefficient. Um, that's why you know because it's monopolizing a market where it's the less uh, valuable product. But in that second case I just described, we also can get an expansion of consumption in market A, and that can that counterbalances the inefficiency in market B. However. In the, in the first case where we had full coverage in market A to start with, we know that in fact we in fact in that case we get full cover we continue to get full coverage. There isn't any expansion um, in uh, market A, and so in that case we know that the result of the tying is is inefficient. Um, okay, the one slide on complements is also just literally one sentence, which is uh, here what we do is we show that if you have an inferior product uh, A, then um, the, everything I just showed you for independent products actually ends up yielding. We get the same thing with the case of complements, you know, an A, B system, but where there's an in a, uh, a less of a good product A uh, relative to the monopolist. Um, and you can just think of the less good product like it, you know, if before, there was monopoly in product A, but you could decide not to buy. Now, instead, you could decide to buy this inferior product. Um, so that's how the complement case works in the paper. All right, uh, potential applications. Um, so in the paper, we just we talk about 
you know, two cases that where the model can at least shed some light, um, I think, on this on the situation. So one is the EU Google and Android case. So in that case, um, you know, Google was found was accused and found uh, guilty of tying um, the Play Store um, to search. Uh, so in other, there was a uh, the Mata contract mobile application distribution agreement contract required that distributors of um, like mobile mobile carriers, for example, um, end up putting uh, Android mobile carriers, I should say, um, in order to get access to the Play Store where Google had a tremendous amount, has a tremendous amount of market power, had to agree to make Google the exclusive out of the box search engine on the phones. So, you know, there, there are definitely differences from the model to that situation in that that situation that just, you know, we had distributors, not single product consumers, for example. But one thing I think is interesting about this is when you think about the Mata, you know, you might ask yourself, like, why did Google tie the Play Store in order to get search exclusivity as opposed to um, just paying for exclusivity? Um, right. And so. You know, potentially the model gives you some explanation for why those two things are different. Okay, that you know, if you just pay, you're not taking advantage of these unexploited uh, of unexploited surplus. Um, a second example. Oh, and you know, the network effect in that case is that search, you know, arguably has uh, you know, I think evidence for. I won't go say too much about this, but. Um, you know, search is a product where there are network effects, direct network effects. The more people are searching on a search engine, the better the quality of the search engine will be. Um, in the EU Microsoft case, uh, Microsoft was uh, had tied the Windows Media Player to Windows, um, and Windows Media Player has indirect network effects. In that, applicate the more people have the Media Player, the more applications are written that are compatible with the media player. Um, okay, so the conclusion, just we had a leverage theory of tying in the presence of network effects in the tied product market. Tying enables the leverage of an exploited consumer surplus in the, in the monopolized product to build a quasi installed base advantage in the tied product market. And tying in these circumstances can be profitable without any pre-commitment. And in particular, what it does is it raises by starting this bandwagon, it raises the perceived quality of the tied product and lowers the perceived quality of tied product rivals. So uh, thanks very much. Sorry for going a little bit long. Um, I will unshare. Yeah, well, so um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for letting me uh, discuss this very nice paper. I learned a lot by uh, by studying this paper. It's a great contribution to the theory of tying. Um, I must say that uh, as far as I can tell, uh, the analytics is fine. So in my discussion, I will focus on the ideas underlying this, uh, uh, this paper. And the basic mechanism, uh, as Mike uh, um, explained, uh, is the uh, is based on the notion of an exploited consumer surplus. Okay, so the idea is that for some reason, a dominant firm and monopolist cannot extract all the surplus from consumers in a market, and therefore that creates scope for imposing contractual restrictions uh, in other markets or uh, related restrictions that uh, uh, that may be, be profitable. Uh, now, when you want to um, tell a story which is based on this uh, uh, unexploited consumer surplus uh, idea, uh, you have to address two key questions. There are two key ele elements in, in any such story. The first one, you have to explain why the dominant firm cannot extract fully the surplus from consumers. Okay, uh, And this, in these time models, is relatively simple, as I will tell in a moment. Uh, in other applications, like, for example, exclusive dealing is more tricky. Uh, and the second part of the story is exactly what is the mechanism whereby you can leverage this and exploit the surplus to raise your profit uh, elsewhere. So just to 
uh, illustrate uh, these two um, parts of, of this type of explanations, let me contrast this paper with a very early paper by Bernstein, uh, which uh, uh, Mike also mentioned. Uh, Bernstein was actually the first to put forward this type of uh, unexploited consumer surplus mechanism. Okay. So uh, there are differences in both respects. So Bernstein has a model where consumers have variable demand, and the reasons why the dominant firm cannot extract the surplus fully is that the dominant firm is restricted to linear pricing. Here, instead, we have a model with discrete demand. So linear pricing is not restricted per se, but what you assume basically is that uh, the dominant firm cannot price discriminate perfectly. Okay? So in this respect, I would say the differences are minor with, with Burstyn. The most important differences, in my opinion, are in the way in which this unexploited consumer surplus is leveraged in, the, uh, uh, in market B. Because what Bastin has is basically a model similar to, to a model of optimal taxation. So the idea is that by tying, the dominant firm can tax with a positive price cost margin two goods or N goods instead of one. And we know that taxing more goods tends to be more efficient. Okay, so it is basically a kind of exploitative abuse, okay, which uh, if I understand correctly, in the US would be tantamount to saying no abuse. Okay. Whereas in this paper, what we have is that uh, a more efficient competitor is evicted because it is denied the scale which uh, create, uh, 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 which, which allow it to exploit the network, network externalities. So, uh, Having said this, I have two uh, comments, two, two um, remarks. The first one is I was wondering whether there may be other uh, exclusionary stories like this, but uh, stories that are not based on the notion of network externality. So think, for example, of uh, a, a setting which is often considered in the exclusive dealing literature and precisely models of naked exclusion. So support that a competitor in market B uh, is a potential entrant, which overall that is even accounting for the entry cost could be more efficient than the dominant firm in, in market B. But the idea is that by tying, you can exploit, the dominant firm can exploit the unexploited surplus basically to deny economies of scale to the competitor and prevent entry. So I was wondering, uh, given that you have given important contributions also to the theory of naked exclusion, whether you have considered this particular, uh, this, this twist, the, it would be another application of the, the, similar, uh, the same idea. Um, a second comment is about this notion of an unexploited surplus. I, th I think it's important to clarify that it has not to be taken literally. That is, it is not strictly necessary that consumers have positive rents. Uh, what really matters is that the dominant firm cannot extract the rents efficiently. Uh, so to, to, uh, to clarify, because if the dominant firm cannot extract the rent efficiently, then it, that means that the dominant firm can give up a euro of profits, so, and that would leave to the consumer more than one euro of surplus. And then the dominant firm could use this more than one euro of surplus in the other market. Okay? So for example, think of this kind of situation in market A. Okay, so this is a situation where your assumption would be violated because the optimal price would be 201. Okay, and, uh, there are, uh, as, as in your example, one consumer of type H and one consumer of type uh, uh, low, uh, low willingness to pay. Uh, monopoly price would be 201, no unex unexploited surplus left. But clearly, you see that here, if the, mono if the dominant firm price at 100, it would lose one euro of profit, but it will leave to uh, consumer age 101 euro of, of rent. And then it could exploit such rent in market B. And it could be that 
that kind of exploit, uh, the, um, the, you know, so much, so, so large a rent could be exploited to gain more than one euro profit. And if I understand correctly, this is what is uh, actually happening in your model in the case of mixed bundling. Okay, so uh, when uh, you 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 uh, notice that there are two conditions, with one condition the market is covered, in the other condition with independent uh, products the market will not be covered. Okay, and uh, in uh, and in that case what you have is that uh, uh, in equilibrium there is mixed bundling. But I mean mixed bundling because the market A is not covered is quite a mechanical effect. No? To me, what is more interesting of this case is that the price of product A actually goes down. Of course, when I say this, I'm saying something loose because it's not priced independently. No? But if you define the price of product A as the difference between the price of the bundle and the price of, of product B, that goes down compared to the case of independent uh, products. And the reason, if I understand correctly, is precisely this one, that is with uncovered market, the way rents are extracted is inefficient. So the dominant firm may want to decrease a little bit or, or decrease the price of, of product A. That creates at least more rent to the consumers. And then the dominant firm can exploit these rents in the market for product B. Whereas if instead the market is covered and you reduce the price of product A, that would transfer rents to the consumers on a one-to-one -one basis. And of course, you cannot profit from this because you cannot extract on, on a more than one-to-one -one basis in the market for product B. So the point is uh, uh, more general. This, this unexploited surplus mechanism is more general. In my opinion, you may tell a story like this whenever the, the pricing in the uh, uh, tying good market is inefficient. It's, it's not, it doesn't allow to extract rent in an efficient way. Thank you.